A specter is haunting civilization, the specter of COVID-19. For a year, the world as we knew it has been plunged into a state of economic shock by the recommendations of unelected health experts, epidemiologists, the CDC and the World Health Organization, social gatherings, both commercial and non-commercial, have been for the most part legally rendered into a state of non-existence. Human migration, interconnectivity, and recreation has been reduced to being virtual as opposed to actual. The only gatherings that do occur are reserved for grocery stores, retail stores, and health care. The COVID-19 pandemic has ravaged and battered the state of humanity into a state of mass neurosis, mass paranoia, mass despair, and mass isolation. So far, the answer provided by Western governments to these recommendations and to this most wretched present state of affairs, at least concerning the United States, where the pandemic imposes itself with the greatest ferocity, with over 410,000 dead so far, has been an answer of brute austerity and cutthroat capitalism. As the corporate-owned and mostly liberal mainstream media lucratively, regarding ad revenues, continues to inundate a shell-shocked American population with news stories 24-7 regarding virus cases, overfilled hospitals, morgue trucks, and never-ending depictions of an obstinate segment of the population, typically Trump supporters, refusing to follow mask mandates. There exists a hideous underbelly beneath the tragedies and controversies regarding COVID-19 currently dominating the spotlight. The long-term psychological and economic toll that the lockdown measures are levying on the decimated proletariat in the name of public safety. And what has been proclaimed by liberals and conservatives alike as the greatest country on earth in the year 2021 while there have been 24 million cases and 410,000 plus deaths that have been attributed to both directly and indirectly to COVID-19, four in 10 Americans overall find themselves food insecure, or to put it more bluntly, starving. It doesn't end there. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 160 million Americans make up the civilian labor force in a nation of 330 million. 43% of working uh, Americans have reported that their wages have been cut and or their jobs have been lost outright due to the COVID outbreak, with 6 in 10 of that 43% being Hispanic. 40 million Americans have filed for unemployment benefits and or have had to sell their labor to low-wage, non-union, but essential retails, retailers and gig work. Close to 200,000 small businesses have been permanently shuttered so far. 20 million Americans face eviction in 2021 potentially adding substantially to the number of 3.5 million Americans who are counted, already sleeping in shelters, and all in all, the while mental health experts prognosticate a grim toll of deaths due to despair, suicide, and overdoses, ranging somewhere between 75,000 to 150,000 by the time the pandemic has reached its medical ending. This is the sacrifice that working Americans have to pay to protect the health of the mostly socially liberal American professional managerial class and the mostly conservative American bourgeoisie who have profited absurdly from these sacrifices, which quietly transforms itself into an economic crisis of biblical proportions. Since the COVID era was ushered in with all of its sheer economic brutality, billionaires have profited enormously. According to USA Today, just to name some obscenities, in 2020 alone, Jeff Bezos made $90 billion, putting his net worth at $203 billion. Elon Musk made $109 billion, 
putting his net worth at $201 billion. Mark Zuckerberg made $46 billion, putting his net worth at $101 billion. The Walton family has made $39 billion, putting their collective net worth at $210 billion. Bill Gates has made $20 billion, putting his net worth at $98 billion. All who make their net worth off of multinational free trade deals, low-wage, non-unionized labor at home and abroad, and who use various legal loopholes to skate around paying their fair share in taxation to the public commons, which they siphon wealth from every single day, and who use local, state, and federal laws to get around paying their workers a living wage. The worst part of it all, however, is that because... Their big industries are deemed as essential, especially in the case of Amazon and Walmart being related to retail and technology. They have used state government COVID mitigation policies drawn up by the good intentions of health experts to mitigate viral spread as a form of economic protectionism and therefore are making themselves the de facto beneficiaries of wealth redistribution from the pro-lockdown capitalist professional managerial class wanting social liberalism but low to moderate taxation and the primary exploiters of the American proletariat who are being rendered into a state of social isolation and serfdom as their public institutions and social safety nets crumble. The response by the United States federal government to this uh, economic crisis underlying the COVID pandemic has been paltry at best, insulting at worst. In late March 2020, the U.S. federal government passed the $2.2 trillion Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act, CARES Act, with $300 billion allocated toward one-time $1,200 cash payments for all Americans, $260 billion funneled into antiquated means-testing state unemployment programs, $600, a $600 unemployment benefit, which expired in late July and has since been uh, reactivated to be $300, uh, $350 billion later to uh, raise to $669 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program allocated towards small business, $500 billion to large corporations, and $339 billion allocated to various state and local governments. In late December 2020, a second $900 billion stimulus was passed, allocating $166 billion in uh, direct uh, $600 checks to Americans, once again one time, $120 billion in extra unemployment aid, as I said before, the $300 checks, and an extra $325 billion tacked on to the PPP, totaling over $1 trillion. On paper, this may not seem paltry. However, only $466 billion went directly to the American people in the form of pecuniary assistance, $1,800 to sustain a working populace who have mostly had their wages substantially reduced and or were thrown out of work indefinitely, but Americans out of work could also collect unemployment insurance, right? Yes, but only certain unemployed Americans could qualify for such benefits if they lose work through no fault of their own and worked enough hours to pay into the system. Not all of the unemployed qualify for unemployment. The $339 billion allocated to various state governments will somehow wind up in the hands of big business who were collectively given a $500 billion bailout. Anyway, the PPP loans, while totaling $1 trillion, are also another means-tested method designated for cash-strapped businesses to survive uh, allocated by states for small business owners to apply for if they meet the criteria to qualify for such. And apparently, despite a federal $1 trillion allocation towards PPP, this did not do enough to save 200,000 small businesses from going under. At the end of all of this, Republicans still embrace the trickle-down austerity model 
championed by Milton Friedman and the Chicago School of Economics, Democrats embrace slightly less austerity with the same free market principles. Uh, Americans were met with the iron fist of austerity when they needed a $3 trillion uh, in aid package that went directly into their hands with no strings attached. Instead, the Treasury facilitated a transfer of public monies into private hands that was even larger than the TARP program passed in 2008. During this critical time, we must also take into account the not publicly owned but not privately owned Federal Reserve System, which determines our national monetary policy through federal fund rates and open market operations. The federal fund rate is the interest rate private banks pay to the Federal Reserve for borrowing. It's more of a sale than an exchange of collateral overnight from other private banks. The lending bank charges a fee, and the interest that is charged is the federal funds rate. The Federal Reserve uses this instrument to influence other interest rates such as credit cards, mortgages, and bank loans. It also affects the value of the U.S. dollar and other household and business assets. At the present time, the interest rate is 0.25%, allowing for private banks to borrow and lend from each other almost as much as they want until the Fed decides to raise the rates in 2023, and they're going to have to pay up. The open market operation is when the Federal Reserve buys, and in the case of uh, wanting interest rates to go lower or sells securities, wanting interest rates to go higher from its member banks. This can be in the form of treasury notes and or mortgage-backed securities. When the Fed engages in quantitative easing, officially it isn't right now, but we know better. It is essentially purchasing at scale government bonds or other financial assets, stocks, banks, deposits, in order to inject money into the economy to expand economic activity. This is where the concept of the Fed printing money out of thin air comes from. The central bank isn't technically printing money, more so as it is uh, borrowing with interest from the same private banks which are regulated by the federal fund rates, purchasing government bonds, which such is defined as an instrument of indebtedness issued by a national government to support government spending to pump up the economy. But this comes with the risk of inflation as the Treasury will print more money to match government spending, diluting the value of the currency as the central bank continues to borrow from private banks to buy more government bonds to back more government spending. The private bank is the lender, with the central bank, the Federal Reserve, being both the borrower and the lender setting interest rates, buying government bonds from the U.S. Treasury to back federal government spending, which goes back to the private financial institutions charging the Fed with interest for lending the capital for the Fed to purchase government treasury bonds, and also goes back to the private banks in the form of direct taxpayer bailouts when the financial institutions claim that they are insolvent. When conservatives complain about being taxed, they blame socialism, yet fail to realize their taxes are funding the very capitalist system that they are alienated by, yet continue to defend. When liberals cheer government spending, they think they're supporting welfare for the people, when in actuality it's welfare for the 1%. The game is rigged. Where is the mass public outrage directed at this most blatant and disgusting gesture of class warfare being waged on the public by government at the behest of the 1%, the same 1% which owns all the mainstream media outlets, by the way, during a pandemic? During this past year of anti-police brutality, Black Lives Matter-backed uprisings producing conflagrations in Minneapolis, Kenosha, Seattle, and Portland, a year which also produced a referendum election that forced the incumbent president Republican populist Donald Trump out of office solely based on his mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
which prompted a plethora of Trump supporters to storm the United States Capitol on January 6th to prevent the election certification of the corporate-backed Joe Biden. Public outrage is definitely not in short supply. However, public outrage is balkanized and segmented. Contrary to the mainstream American liberal leftist narrative, with animus placed directly upon racial injustice, immigration justice, dismantling white supremacy, sexual inequality, environmental justice, and other various intersectional struggles, the wholesale concept of class struggle, proletariat versus bourgeoisie, which has been the traditional bread and butter of the left, has been pushed to the back burner. The anti-corporate narrative instead has been dominated by the reactionary American right wing, who as of late have been equating corporatism and economic neoliberalism with a socialist New World Order conspiracy. This narrative is also fueling the anti-lockdown movement, with the belief that the globalists are fabricating COVID-19 as a means to implement a coup on the sovereignty of the American people. And it is here where we find ourselves in a most interesting scenario. Grassroots American conservatives, motivated by the racist dog whistles of limited government, are rejecting the Washington consensus of economic liberalization, global capitalism, and privatization ushered in by the Reagan administration and further facilitated along by subsequent democratic administrations by labeling such as socialism. While mainstream American liberals wholly embrace the concept of economic globalization, so long as the philosophy presents a socially progressive front that promotes racial and sexual incon inclusivity and a commitment to challenge climate change. The liberals are suddenly pro-establishment and pro-capitalist labeling such as socialism and the conservatives are anti-establishment and anti-capitalist labeling such a, as a struggle against socialism. Odd that, uh, that few organizers are picking up on this. The anti-lockdown -lock protests conducted by the American right, which take on an anti-establishment, anti-corporate, and outlandish anti-science flavor, are met with outright anger and dismissal by the mainstream liberal left, dominated by the influence of not the proletariat, but the MSNBC viewing professional managerial class who continue to show a lack of urgency regarding the economic and social damages imposed by COVID mitigation measures and downplay the overall magnitude of disaster capitalism that is being levied on the working class with an overemphasis on what the pandemic is doing on the surface as it is relevant to the mainstream in terms of COVID cases, hospitalizations, deaths, and the level of overall mass compliance, but with little to no focus on the catastrophic economic and social collateral damages that are being levied in the name of a public health protocol. Underneath the outlandish QAnon internet conspiracy theories of an anti-Semitic satanic pedophile uh, sex cult making up the deep state, anti-corporate rhetoric and anti-vaccination rhetoric is a very real anxiety of economic marginalization that is not being vocalized by this segment of the population due to their lack of proper understanding of the social conflict theory promulgated by Marx and Engels due to uh, generations of Cold War era anti-socialist rhetoric. It would be the best interest for the astute American organizer not to automatically react in unison with American liberals saying, trust the science, wear a mask, don't be selfish, to the outlandish nature of the anti-lockdown protests or outright denialism of COVID, but to instead take direction from the organizers of the India-based farmers movement and develop strategies around organizing and channeling the economic anxiety underpinning these protests 
and convert the anti-lockdown and anti-corporate sentiment expressed by these American conservatives into a broader movement that directly challenges neoliberalism, privatization, police militarization, and the systemic austerity that comes with such. While we must acknowledge that COVID-19 is not a hoax, and all do our part in doing whatever we can in stopping the spread of COVID-19, at the same time, we must recognize that this pandemic is being used as a money-making grift. We must not let the pandemic alone divert our attention from the very real class conflict that the neoliberal bourgeoisie are waging on the proletariat and lupin proletariat while they're making sacrifices to protect the health of the professional managerial class who are the main customers of the bourgeoisie. We must take advantage of the anti-neoliberal and anti-corporate sentiment currently expressed by the grassroots American right and dispel the conspiracy theorist garbage and racial propaganda collectively polluting the minds of a people who, despite having no sense of class or intersectional struggle, know that there is something wrong with the system and direct that animus towards providing a direct challenge to neoliberalism and global capitalism. Finally, we must wage a unified class struggle both politically and on the streets against the establishment for their outright bipartisan refusal to provide adequate aid to the American people in their most dire time of need since the Great Depression. Do not let the red and blue echo chambers of partisanship distract you or lead you astray from the bigger picture. The class struggle is real and the class struggle is right now. This is not a drill. We are still the 99% and despite our differences, we need to organize and stand together if we are going to find ourselves in a post-pandemic world that is going to work for everyone. And that is all I have to say about that.